All right, yeah, I'm still in San Marco de Colón. Beautiful place. We went to a mirador yesterday and saw the volcanoes of Nicaragua. We saw the Pacific. We saw the valley of Choloteca and the mountains of San Marco de Colón. Beautiful place. You guys have to come here. Mission Lazarus. So now we're on chapter 3. I'll try to read it straight through. And it's the wood between the worlds. Beware, guys, when you're doing business with a mad scientist who doesn't know what he's doing. So Uncle Andrew and his study vanished instantly. Remember the rings. Then for a moment, everything became muddled. The next thing Diggory knew was that there was a soft green light coming down on him from above and darkness below. He didn't seem to be standing on anything or sitting or lying. Nothing appeared to be touching him. I believe I'm in water, said Diggory, or underwater. This frightened him for a second, but almost at once he could feel that he was rushing upward. Then his head suddenly came out into the air and he found himself scrambling ashore, out onto smooth grassy ground at the edge of a pool. As he rose to his feet, he noticed that he was neither dripping nor panting for breath, as anyone would expect after being underwater. His clothes were perfectly dry. He was standing by the edge of a small pool, not more than ten feet from side to side, in a wood. The trees grew close together and were so leafy that he could get no glimpse of the sky. All the light was green light that came through the leaves, but there must have been a very strong sun overhead, for this green daylight was bright and warm. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. There were no birds, no insects, no animals, and no wind. You could almost feel the trees growing. The pool had just got out of was not only a pool, was not the only pool. There were dozens of others, a pool every few yards and as far as his eyes could reach. You could almost feel the trees drinking the water up with their roots. This wood, or the woods, was very much alive. When he tried to describe it afterward, Diggory always said, it was a rich place, as rich as plum cake. The strangest thing was that, almost before he had looked about him, Diggory had half forgotten how he had come there. At any rate, he was certainly not thinking about Polly or Uncle Andrew or even his mother. He was not in the least frightened or excited or curious, and if anyone had asked him, where did you come from, he would probably have said, I've always been here. And that was what it felt like, as if one had always been in that place and never been bored, although nothing had ever happened. And as he said long afterwards, it's not the sort of place where things happen. Trees go on growing, and that's all. After Diggory had looked at the wood for a long time, he noticed that there was a girl lying on her back at the foot of a tree a few yards away. Her eyes were nearly shut, but not quite, as if she were just between sleeping and waking. And so he looked at her for a long time and said, Nothing. And at last she opened her eyes and looked at him for a long time, and she also said, Nothing. Then she spoke in a dreamy, contented sort of voice. I think I've seen you before, she said. Uh, I rather think so, too, said Degree. Have you been here long? Oh, always, said the girl. At least, I don't know, a very long time. So have I, said Degree. No, you haven't, she said. I've just seen you come up out of that pool. Uh, yes, I suppose I did, said Diggory with a puzzled air. Uh, I had forgotten. Then for quite a long time, neither said any more. Look here, said the girl presently. I wonder, did we ever really meet before? I had a sort of idea, a sort of picture in my head of a boy and a girl like us living somewhere quite different and doing all sorts of things. Perhaps it was only a dream. I've had that same dream, I think, said Diggory, about a boy and a girl living next door and something about crawling among rafters. And I remember the girl had a dirty face. 
Aren't you getting it mixed? In my dream, it was the boy who had the dirty face. Well, I can't remember the boy's face, said Diggory, and then added, uh, Hello, what's that? Why? It's a guinea pig, said the girl. And it was a fat guinea pig nosing about in the grass. But round the middle of the guinea pig, there ran a tape, and tied on it by the tape was a bright yellow ring. There's the guinea pig with the ring tied onto it. Look, look, said Diggory, the ring, and look, you've got one on your finger, and so have I. The girl now sat up really interested at last, and they stared really hard at one another, trying to remember, and then, at exactly the same moment, she shouted, Mr. Ketterly, and he shouted out, Uncle Andrew, and they knew who they were and began to remember the whole story, and after a few minutes of hard talking, they got it straight. Diggory explained how beastly Uncle Andrew had been. Well, what do we do now, said Polly? Take the guinea pig and go home. There's no hurry, said Diggory with a huge yawn. I think there is, said Polly. This place is too quiet. It's so, so dreamy. You're almost asleep. And if we once give in to it, we shall just lie down and drowse forever and ever. It's very nice here, said Diggory. Yes, it is, said Polly, but we've got to get back. She stood up and began to go cautiously toward the guinea pig, but then she changed her mind. We might as well leave the guinea pig, she said. It's perfectly happy here, and your uncle will only do something horrid to it if we take it home. I bet he would, answered Diggory. Look at the way he's treated us. By the way, how do we get home? Go back into the pool, I expect. And they came and stood together at the edge, looking down into the smooth water. It was full of the reflection of the green, leafy branches, and they made it look very deep. We haven't any bathing things, said Polly. We shan't need them, silly, said Degree. We're going in with our clothes on. Don't you remember? It didn't wet us on our way up. Can you swim? A bit. Can you? Well, not much. Well, I don't think we shall need to swim, said Diggory. We want to go down, don't we? Neither of them liked the idea of jumping into that pool, but neither said so to the other. They took hands and said, one, two, three, go, and they jumped. There was a great splash, and of course they closed their eyes, but when they opened them again, they found that they were still standing hand in hand in that green wood and hardly up to their ankles in water. The pool was apparently only a couple of inches deep, and they splashed back onto the dry ground. What on earth has gone wrong? said Polly in a frightened voice, and not so quite frightened as you might expect, because it is hard to feel really frightened in that wood. The place is too peaceful. Ah, I know, said Diggory, and of course it won't work. We're still wearing our yellow rings. They're for the outward journey, you know? And the green ones take you home. We must change rings. Have you got pockets? Good. Put your yellow ring in your left. I've got two greens. Here's one for you. They put on their green rings and came back to the pool. But before they tried... Another jump, Diggory gave a long, ooh. What's the matter, said Polly. I've just had a really wonderful idea, said Diggory. What are all the other pools? Mm. How do you mean? Interesting, the other pools could maybe take you to different universes or worlds. Why? If we can get back to our own world by jumping into this pool, mightn't we get somewhere else by jumping into one of the others? Supposing there was a world at the bottom of every pool. But I thought we were already in your Uncle Andrew's other world or other place or whatever he called it. Didn't you say? Oh, bother Uncle Andrew, interrupted Diggory. I don't believe he knows anything about it. He never had the pluck to come here himself. He only talked of one other world. But 
Suppose there were dozens. You mean this wood might be only one of them? No. I don't believe this wood is a world at all. I think it's just a sort of uh, in-between place. Polly looked puzzled. Don't you see? No, do listen. Think of our tunnel under the slates at home. It isn't a room in any of the houses. And in a way, it isn't really part of any of the houses. But once you're in the tunnel, you can go along it and come out into any of the houses in the row. Mightn't this wood be like the same? A place that isn't in any of the worlds, but once you've found that place, you can get into them all. Well, even if you can, began Polly, but Diggory went on as if he hadn't heard her. And of course that explains everything, he said. That's why it is so quiet and sleepy here. Because nothing ever happens here. Like at home. It's in the houses that people talk and do things and have meals. Nothing goes on in the in-between places, behind the walls and above the ceilings and under the floor. Or in our own tunnel. But when you come out of our tunnel, you may find yourself in any house. And I think we can get out of this place into jolly well anywhere. We don't need to jump back into the same pool we came up by. Or not just yet. The wood between the worlds, said Polly dreamily. It sounds rather nice. Come on, said Degree. Which pool shall we try? Look here, said Polly. I'm going to try any new pool till we've made sure we can get back by the old one. We're not even sure if it'll work yet. Yes, said Diggory, and get caught by Uncle Andrew and have our rings taken away before we've had any fun. Uh, no, thank you. Couldn't we just go part of the way down and into our own pool, said Polly, just to see if it works, and then if it does, we'll change rings and come up again before we're ready, before we're really back in Mr. Ketterly's study? Uh, can we go part of the way down? Well, it took time coming up. I suppose it'll take a little time going back down. Diggory made rather a fuss about agreeing to this, but he had to in the end because Polly absolutely refused to do any exploring in the new worlds until she had made sure about getting back to the old one. She was quite as brave as he was about some dangers and wasps, but she was not so interested in finding out things nobody had ever heard of before, for Diggory was the sort of person who wants to know everything, and when he grew up, he became the famous Professor Kirk, who comes into other books. Uh, after a good deal of arguing, they agreed to put on their green rings. Green for safety, said Diggory, so you can't help remembering which is which, and hold hands and jump. But as soon as they seemed to be getting back to Uncle Andrew's study, or even to their own world, Polly was to shout, change! And they would slip off their greens and put on their yellows. And Diggory wanted to be the one who shouted, change, but Polly wouldn't agree. They put on their green rings, took hands, and once more shouted, One, two, three, go! And this time it worked. It was very hard to tell you what it felt like, for everything happened so quickly. And at first there were bright lights moving about in a black sky, and Diggory always thinks these were stars and even swears that he saw Jupiter quite close. Close enough to see its moon. But almost at once there were rows and rows of roofs and chimney pots about them. And they could see St. Paul's and knew they were looking at London. But you could see through the walls of all the houses. And then they could see Uncle Andrew, very vague and shadowy, but getting clearer and more solid looking all the time, just as if he were coming into focus. But before he became quite real, Polly shouted, Change! And they did change. And our world faded away like a dream. The green light above grew stronger and stronger till their heads came out of the pool and they scrambled ashore. And there was the wood all about them, as green and bright and still as ever, and the whole thing had taken less than a minute. There, said Diggory, that's all right. Now for the adventure. Any pool will do. Come on, let's try that one. Stop, said Polly. Aren't we going to mark this pool? And they stared at each other and turned quite white as they realized the dreadful thing that Diggory had just been going to do, for there were any number of pools in the wood, and the pools were all alike, and the trees were all alike, 
so that if they had once left behind the pool that led to our own world without making some sort of landmark, the chances would have been a hundred to one against their ever finding it again. Polly's right. You gotta make a mark. Diggory's hand was shaking as he opened his penknife and cut out a long strip of turf on the bank of the pool. The soil, which smelled nice, was of a rich reddish brown and showed up well against the green. It's a good thing one of us has some sense, said Polly. Well, don't keep on gassing about it, said Diggory. Come along. I want to see what's in one of the other pools. Polly gave him a pretty sharp answer, and he said something even nastier in reply. The quarrel lasted for several minutes, but it would be dull to write it all down. Let us skip on to the moment at which they stood with beating hearts and rather scared faces on the edge of the unknown pool with their yellow rings on and held hands once more and said, One, two, three, go! Splash! And once again, it had worked. This pool, too, appeared to be only a puddle. Instead of reaching a new world, they only got their feet wet and splashed their legs for a second time that morning. If it were still morning, and it seemed to always be the same in the wood between the worlds. Blast and botheration, exclaimed Diggory. What's gone wrong now? We've put our yellow rings on all right. He said yellow for the outward journey. Now the truth was that Uncle Andrew, who knew nothing about the wood between the worlds, had quite a wrong idea about the rings. The yellow ones weren't outward rings, and the green ones weren't homeward rings. At least not in the way he thought. The stuff of which both were made had all come from the wood. The stuff in the yellow rings had the power of drawing you into the wood. It was the stuff that wanted to get back to its own place the in-between place. But the stuff in the green rings is stuff that is trying to get out of its own place, so that a green ring would take you out of the wood and into a world. Uncle Andrew, you see, was working with things he did not really understand. Most magicians are. Of course, Diggory did not realize the truth quite clearly either, or not till later, But when they had talked it over, they decided to try their green rings on the new pool, just to see what happened. I'm game if you are, said Polly, but she really said this because in her heart of hearts, she now felt sure that neither kind of ring was going to work at all in the new pool. And so there's nothing worse to be afraid of than another splash. And I'm not quite sure that Diggory had not the same feeling. Well, at any rate, when they had both put on their greens and come back to the edge of the water and taken hands again, they were certainly a good deal more cheerful and less solemn than they had been the first time. One, two, three, go, said Diggory. And they jumped. And that's the end of chapter three. And again, the way that C.S. Lewis ends these chapters with so much suspense, it makes me want to immediately read on into chapter four. Thanks, guys, for listening.